Dr. Josh Bondi, and I'm the Director of Research at the Nevada Science Center. The Nevada Science Center is a research and education outreach uh, nonprofit center for, uh, housed in Henderson, Nevada, and we look forward to bringing science to everybody, no matter where you're at or where, what you're up to. So in talking about the fall equinox, we're talking yeah. about how the sun and the earth interact with one another. And one of the most historical ways that the sun has interacted with people, at least, is our ability to tell time. And so just as a quick exercise, because we're at the start of our virtual field trip, we decided we had set up a mock uh, sundial. And so what we do is we have a, a stick or a, or a pen sticking to a plate here. We have just kind of a fake clock writ, uh, diagrammed on the back of our plate. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark where the shadow is from the straw onto our plate. And we'll see kind of at the end of our, of our virtual field trip, if we have any sort of movement, then we can test how fast so the So it's sun... about one o'clock right now. So you wanna rotate? You wanna that? rotate? Let's make it accurate, huh? There we go. So we'll do a line here. All right, so at the end of the virtual field trip, we're gonna come back to the sundial and see how far the shadow has moved, if at all, uh, over the course of the presentation. Ideally, we would do this all day long and you'd mark it every hour to see where it's at, but you know, we only have about 20 minutes, half hour at most. So let's get into it. All right, so what is the equinox? The equinox represents a, the two times of the year when it's equal 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of nighttime, uh, across the planet. And so how does this happen uh, twice a year? Follow me here to our diagram or to our model. So the earth doesn't have a vertical axis to the sun. So the earth's axis is at about 23 degrees off from vertical uh, compared to the rest of the solar system. So if I follow through the seasons here, to an equinox, what happens is, the tilt of our planet is parallel to the sun. And so that means that an equal amount of sunlight or radiation impacts every surface of the planet that day. That happens to be today, and it'll happen again in the spring. And so that means that we get 12 hours of daylight all across the globe, so an equal amount, equal, equal equinox uh, throughout the year. And so what does this represent also? What does it mean? For Earth, this also means a change of the seasons. And so as, the, as we continue through our, through our year here, all right, so when we get into, say, summertime, the axis of our planet, summertime in the Northern Hemisphere, I should say, the tilt of our planet is towards the sun. And so in the Northern Hemisphere, we're getting a lot more radiation. And so that heats up the atmosphere, heats up the planet, at least in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, and gives us summertime. During wintertime, in this case, in the Southern Hemisphere, the, the planet is pointing away from the sun and getting less radiation. And so that makes it colder and thus winter time. Right now, today, the tilt of our planet is about 23 and a half degrees from vertical. And that's what's diagrammed here on, the, on our little model. In the past and not too distant past, Earth's axis has actually wobbled a little bit. So between 24 and a half degrees to 21 degrees. So during the last ice ages, it was actually a little bit steeper of a tilt. So it was actually about 24 degrees. And so with that steeper tilt, there was more extreme seasonality or more extreme winters, more extreme summers. And with those more extreme winters, that allowed more snow to accumulate in places like Canada, Norway, Sweden, and glaciers were able to form. And so it helped form the, the ice ages with the change in how Earth's orbit or how Earth interacts with the sun. So with those more extreme uh, seasons and more extreme weather, and global cooling during this period of time, during the ice ages, we have different plants across Nevada. So the plants that you see in Reno, the plants that you see in Las Vegas, the plants that you see maybe in Elko or in Pioch, they were different during the last ice age because the global climate was a little bit cooler. And so plants that were up here on Mount Charleston where we're about 7,000 feet elevation right now would have been a lot lower elevation. So maybe 2,000 2, feet elevation or even lower so during the last ice age, plant communities that you see behind me here up at the retreat would have been down in Las Vegas. And corresponding with those plant communities moving, we also would have seen the animals that are dependent on those plants moving as well. So you think about 
uh, different types of birds, different types of rodents that eat pine nuts and different types of pine cones, all would have been changing their distribution as well in relation to where uh, the plants are, are adapting to the changing world. That brings us to the concept of a biome. So biomes are communities of living organisms, plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, that all coexist in a given geographic area. And so when we drive up Mount Charleston, or if you drive up Mount Rose, or if you drive up any mountain range that's near you, if you're not here in North America or here in Nevada, drive up any mountain, you know the plants change. And if you haven't noticed that, you need to get your nose out of your, out of your phone. Uh, so as we drive up Mount Charleston, in this case, we're driving through several different biomes or different types of communities. So down in the Las Vegas Valley, we're down in what's called the creosote biome. So these creosote bushes dominate the vegetation of the area. We have lots of ground squirrels and lots of finches and sparrows that live amongst these bushes, these low growing bushes. If you go up in elevation just a little bit, you encounter a hallmark plant to the Mojave Desert. So if you're especially not from the Southwest, you probably haven't seen these plants in person, but these are Joshua trees. Joshua trees grow at about 3,000 feet elevation to about 4,000 feet elevation. Uh, their scientific name is Yucca brevifolia. And during the last ice age, they've found a mummified giant ground sloth poop in caves not too far from here. And it turns out the flowers of these things were a favorite of giant ground sloths. As a paleontologist, I have to throw in all the fossil stuff too. All right, so if we go above the Joshua trees to about 4,000, 5,000 feet elevation, we get into the sagebrush and the pinion, pine, and juniper plants, or trees, excuse me. And so these are plants that are pretty common across Northern Nevada, but if you're here in Southern Nevada, you only encounter them when you're very high elevations or relatively high elevations. If we were to continue up the mountain, so we're here at about the pinion juniper range. So, so the plants around us are mostly pinions and junipers with a couple of members of this next one, if I grab the right, diagram, ponderosa pines. So if you live up near Reno, you definitely see these things all growing all along the uh, eastern slopes of the Sierras and the Carson Range. Uh, here in Southern Nevada, they're not nearly as common unless you get up to about 6,000 feet elevation. But a couple of the trees behind me are actually ponderosa pines here. And then if you continue up the mountain, you eventually encounter fir trees. And then if you get to the very tops of these mountain ranges, you encounter the oldest known living organisms on the planet, which are the bristle cone pines. So bristle cones are actually, uh, again, the oldest known organisms on the planet. Some of them have dated to at least 6,000 years old based upon their tree rings. So counting up each individual year uh, that that plant was alive and making bark. So this pattern of different biomes going up the mountains is pretty similar across the Great Basin. So if you go to Elko County, Washoe County, here in Clark County, as you go up the mountains, you encounter kind of the same pattern of different tree, tree communities or tree biomes as you go up slope. So uh, here in Southern Nevada, we go from the Las Vegas Valley is about 2,000 feet or 1,900 feet elevation, where at the top of Mount Charleston is almost 12,000 feet. So it's the third highest peak in the Great Basin. So we have a lot of elevation gain. We have a lot of different plant communities in a lot of different animal communities as well. Uh, just a little bit earlier, I don't know if it will come hopping through again. I saw a scrub jay, which is a type of, it's a plant, it's a, not a plant, it's a bird, a blue bird that's related to a crow or a magpie. Uh, they're really pretty birds, but they, they uh, flourish in these types of pinion and juniper landscapes. They, they're omnivores, so they eat uh, seeds and they also eat little mammals and things like that. All right. So along with plants moving, we also get the animals moving as well. So with the seasons changing, animals and plants have to adapt. And so how do animals and plants adapt to the changing of the seasons? How have they figured this out? Well, we have a really cool example right here. This is a piece of petrified wood. It's about 14 million years old. And each one of these individual little blobs in here is a seed. So this is a seed cache that got fossilized. So some little squirrel or some little bird was stashing away seeds all year long 
in the hollow of a tree so that it could get it so it had food to get through winter time probably but the little animal never came back to eat its seeds before this tree got knocked down by a volcanic mud flow and then fossilized to turn into petrified wood so it just goes to show that animals have been and plants have been adapting to the changing seasons for millions of years and kind of on a grand scheme of things as as conditions change whether it be on the on the scale of a season or whether it be on the scale of uh, climate change over thousands of years or millions of years uh, plants and animals have to adapt and so this these are the fronds of a cycad so cycads you can still find these around today they're used as ornamental plants uh, they're sold at nurseries as sago palms even though they are not palm trees actually more closely related to pine trees because they have cones but these things were found in valley fire state park here in southern nevada and they're from 100 million years ago so these things were grown wild uh, if you see these things grown as ornamentals around your school or around your office building they really don't like living in the desert today so uh, they live here begrudgingly because somebody planted them in the ground and is trying to water them to keep them alive most of them fry in the sun down here now but 100 million years ago this was a good place to be a side cat If we go up near Reno, Nevada, uh, just outside of Pyramid Lake, you see this big broad leaf, leaf here. So this plant is about 12 million years old, or at least the, the plant that this leaf fell off of into this pond. And what this represents is a period of time before the Sierra Nevada off to our west uplifted to the massive mountain range that it is today. And so uh, prior to that, moist air mass is coming off of the Pacific Ocean would come in and they would dump rain in places like uh, Reno and Fallon and Elko. Uh, but as the Sierra Nevada is uplifted, all that water got cut off from the Pacific and we turned into a big rain shadow desert today and are now the driest state in the United States. So again, on the scale of millions of years, plants and animals have to adapt to changing seasons. And so uh, when we look at our, as we celebrate our changing of the seasons today, uh, we can look at how other organisms interact with changing seasons as well. So what's another way that organisms can interact with or deal with the changing season? Our state reptile, the, the desert tortoise, how does it deal with uh, changing seasons? How does it deal with wintertime coming and all of its food sources going away? They go into hibernation. And so they go into their burrows that they excavate and they just wait out winter time until conditions are right again. Then they come back out, they wake up and they come out and they eat the cactuses and they drink water from thunderstorms. And uh, that's, how they, that's how they deal with the uh, seasons changing. Or you can think of a bear. So bears, they like to go out and they gorge themselves on lots of food, berries and bugs and things like that. And then they live through the winter off of their tissues. So all that fat that's stored up in their bodies, they eat that, their body eats that through the winter time to get them through until springtime and they come back out and it's, it's back, to, back to business as usual. Uh, organisms also, or organisms, human organisms, <laughs> also interact with the changing of the seasons. You can think of some modern ways that we celebrate fall in, in our modern culture. Uh, as a former football player, I know like fall time is football season. So you get the smell of the grass and we celebrate football here in the US anyways. Uh, well, that's a really recent example of how we celebrate a change into the season. But think of places like Stonehenge in the UK. You know, it's essentially a great big sundial like we have in front of me here. Uh, so all these massive stones are, are tracking the changing of the seasons where the sun rises and falls throughout the year. So it was really important to people or else they wouldn't have taken the time to construct and figure out all of these different patterns and construct such a massive structure for, the, for that time period if it wasn't so important to track the changing of the seasons. More locally, uh, the Northern Paiutes on the Walker River Reservation, they have the Numu, they just recently had their Pine Nut Festival. And so the Pine Nut Festival is a celebration and a blessing for a plentiful pine nut harvest. So pine nuts come from the pinyon pines that I talked about a little bit ago uh, and is a food source for indigenous tribes across the Great Basin. I'm a member of the Western Shoshone or the Newe, and to this day, I still go out and collect pine nuts with my family. And it's now it's a treat, but historically it's been a food source and a staple for our tribe uh, surviving in these conditions. So the pine nuts survive throughout the winter time as a food uh, to continue to cook. So because of the importance of pine nuts, 
And because of how long, the significance of how long bristlecone pines actually live, uh, those are actually Nevada's two state trees. So the, the pinion pine and the bristlecone pine. So uh, I think with that, we're nearly done with our presentation, but I promised that we were gonna double check on our sundial, but I tried to uh, masterfully recreate what Becky's a much better job at doing. <laughs> I'm sorry about the technical problems. That's what happens when you do it on the fly. That's the fun of live TV, right? All right, so hopefully we can kind of move it a little bit. So you can see um, the shadow was casted on where Josh marked it. I marked it on the right side. And he marked it on the right side. So I'm gonna just move this a little bit so you can kind of see where it actually has moved a little bit just right on the outside of it. So this is a project you can do in your classroom, even at home. So you grab a paper plate or a piece of paper, and then um, I used a Sharpie, a marker, you mark your like a clock, and then I put a straw, but you can use a pencil or anything else to stick through the middle, and you just follow it throughout the day at where the shadow is casted. So it's a fun activity to kind of do, um, for a few hours, just every hour, just go out and mark it. So we got a little bit of movement in just about 20 minutes, but it's a fun learning activity you can even do at home or in your classroom at school. All right, with that, I think we're ready to take any questions you might have about uh, anything we've talked about, or you know, if you have any questions about the Science Center. We do. Uh, there's, there's a number of questions from the students. So some of the students wanted to know, can you tell us the difference uh, between solstice and equinox? Absolutely. So equinox, I'll use my model here since we have a visual aid. Let's see. All right, so again, equinox, the tilt of our planet, the axis of our planet is parallel to the sun. So there's no one part on the planet getting any more or less energy than any other part. So there's 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of nighttime, every place along the planet. Versus a solstice, during summer solstice is the peak of when your hemisphere is pointing towards the sun, whether you're in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. And so that's also going to be the longest day of the year for you is summer solstice because you're pointing the closest to the sun. Whereas the winter solstice is going to be your shortest day of the year because you're that part of your planet or the part of the planet you're living on is pointing away from the sun so you get the least amount of daylight so so equinox uh, you get 12 hours of equal daylight solstices are either the longest or shortest day of the year so we have two equinox and two solstice a year right that's interesting to know uh so the kids also want to know can you uh talk about across the state of nevada the different kind of biomes they they would see if they traveled uh all across the state absolutely so a lot of the patterns I just talked about as we drive up Mount Charleston hold true for most of the state. A couple differences being that as soon as you get about north of Goldfield or Tonopah, which is about the middle of the geographic middle part of the state of Nevada, for those of you who aren't from the state, uh, you lose the Joshua trees. So they don't like living where it's too cold. So as we go farther and farther north, uh, you lose those, you lose the creosote. And the valley bottoms, rather than being covered in creosote, are usually salt pans or dried up lake beds, which are full of salt. And so lots of plants have a hard time with those salts. So if you're any other place in the state, valley bottoms are usually plants like shad scale, four wing salt brush, or other plants that are really salt tolerant. Then as you go above the, the, the salt pans, you get into low sagebrush. As you go a little bit higher than that, you start getting into Indian tea and big sagebrush. And then once you get above that, we start picking up the patterns we were just talking about. Are you getting the pinion juniper, then the ponderosas, then the, the firs, and then eventually bristlecone pines are found on a number of mountain ranges across the Great Basin. So uh, what you mentioned the Joshua trees. We have a question from Ms. Straub, Straub's class. Uh, apologies if I mispronounced that, but they wanted to know if you by chance knew how the Joshua tree got its name. Um, I've heard a story that it looked like a biblical person out in the middle of the desert to some of the first uh, Western explorers that came out here. And so it got its name from that. You are spot on. I, I had to Google that one. That's exactly <laughs> what was online. That's impressive. <laughs> uh, so Ms. Troop's class also wanted to know, and this has to do with paleontology. Um, how do you guys locate a fossil? 
That's a great story or a great question. Uh, and I'll give you a great story, hopefully. Uh, so the way that we locate fossils is we have to be really good geologists, number one. And so we have to know the right types of rocks, the right age of rocks. And what we do, it's like old timey prospecting. We put our backpacks on with lots of water and we just go hiking out in the desert or usually the desert, sometimes in the mountains with our eyes on the ground and you're looking for patterns. So you're looking for like leaf patterns or you're looking for wood patterns or bone patterns. So it's a lot of pattern recognition. Oftentimes, or hopefully it's not oftentimes, but it does happen. You get skunked where you don't find anything. Uh, but, you know, over time, you find lots and lots of stuff just hiking around. Yeah, it sounds a lot like it's a numbers game uh, from what you've described. And they also want to know, what's the oldest fossil that you've ever found? So the oldest fossils I've ever found are in Esmeralda County. And those date back to about 900 million years old. So almost a billion years old. And so that's how long the history of life in Nevada is. That we have these really... And mind you, these are not spectacular fossils. They're fossils of pond scum. And so they're just layers and layers of pond scum that were growing on a rock on the edge of the ocean 900 million years ago. Uh, nothing, nothing crazy, but that was the most complex form of life on the planet during that period of time. Could you, uh, by chance, tell us, like, if you, if you know offhand, the oldest dinosaur fossil ever found by anyone? Do they know that yet? The oldest dinosaur fossils date back to about 240 million years old, and they come from South America, from Argentina. Wow, that is, uh, that's a while ago. Um, so we had uh, some questions about minerals from the students. They wanted to know, um, it, what are some of the natural industries in Nevada, across the state of Nevada, and what do they have to do with as far as like minerals and mining, and specifically what kind of minerals and mining? So a lot of the minerals in mining, Nevada is the number one gold producer in the United States. And so if Nevada was considered its own country producing gold, it would actually be number four in the world for gold production. Uh, we also rank high in silver and copper production. And then we are the largest producer of lithium in the entire United States. And all these other rocks I just talked about kind of come from bedrock. So you have to go kind of uh, go out there, you have to mine it, you have to process it, you have to smelt it and you have to extract the metals from a bedrock. The lithium's a lot different because lithium is actually found dissolved in groundwater. And so what they do is they drill wells, they pump out these brines and they let them dry out on the salt pans. Then they come out, they scrape up all the salts and then they get the lithium out of the salt. So uh, Nevada is actually one of the top mineral producers in the United States. That's interesting to know. And um, before we let you go, first of all, thank you everyone for sending in all, all the questions. Um, can you talk to the kids a little bit as, as a paleontologist? And obviously today you're talking about astrophysics and astrology, the importance as a scientist to discover, to, to discover new disciplines of science. Yeah, I think as a scientist, it's good just to be well-rounded in a number of different sub-disciplines. Uh, paleontology is kind of really obnoxious that way because we have to know biology, we have to know geology, and it's also really useful to know chemistry, it's really useful to know physics, and for those of you who don't like math, you have to know math too, and so just think of a way that you can make math fun. Uh, astrophysics, I mean, is almost all math, but it's, it's a fun thing to get into because when we start thinking about looking up at the night sky and seeing all the stuff out there, everything we know about the night sky scientifically had to be calculated by somebody doing really good math. And uh, if that's the type of questions that you like to ask when you're out on a camping trip or something like that, or out hiking, or just on your back patio looking up at night, uh, just keep in mind, you know, keep working on those math lessons because it'll pay off.